We've been studying objects moving along straight lines, either on inclines or on surfaces or falling straight up and down, but we haven't allowed objects to move freely in two dimensions. And so this unit involves modeling two-dimensional motion. And so our first activity will be to look at which ball in this apparatus will hit the ground first. This ball right here is, um, has, is supported by a little pole that, that goes inside of it, in, inside a hole. And, um, and, this, and, this, and that's connected to a rod right here. When we release the spring mechanism, it's going to fire this ball out to the left, and simultaneously, it's going to allow this ball to drop straight down. Well, the ball fired to the left is eventually going to hit the tabletop down here somewhere. And the ball that's dropped is going to hit the tabletop there. And the question is, which one's going to hit the ground first? So we're asking a question about time. And what I want you to do is take a moment and think about which one might hit the ground first. I'd encourage you to draw a force diagram once this ball is released. Draw a force diagram for that ball. The one that's, that's fired. And, uh, and then the one that's dropped, I'd also like you to construct a force, another force diagram for the, it. Once it's released into the, into the air, and we're going to see which one hits the ground first. And take a time to make those two force diagrams. The screen's not cooperating here, but draw a force diagram for each, each ball, the, the shot and the drop ball, and think about all the forces acting on them. And please pause the video and take some time to think about it and come up with your prediction for which one hits the ground first. So pause the video now. All right, so you've had a chance to think about it. So let's look at the forces involved. Now the ball that's fired to the left, there's going to be a push from the rod initially. But as soon as it leaves contact, in fact, the entire time it's in the air, it's going to um, not be affected by that push anymore. At least it's not going to have a force from the rod on the ball. We definitely have the gravitational force from the entire Earth on the ball. And so there's the, the push force is not on it anymore. There might be a little bit of air drag acting on it, but we're talking about a ball bearing hitting a few air particles. It's not like a, a, a sheet of paper with a large surface area. And the, the ball is going to be a solid. Ball. It, the, the effect of air drag is probably minimal on that. Well, it ends up that even though the ball is moving to the left and it's dropping, gravity is the only significant force acting on it. Okay. If you did have some air drag, it would kind of be going up against its, its motion, so that might be up in that direction. So a little bit of air drag, and then the ball that is um, dropped. Now, the, the ball that's being dropped is a little less massive because it has a hole in it, so its weight's going to be a little bit less than the other one. And since it's falling straight down, it might have a little bit of air drag acting straight up. But it ends up that vertically, even the one with some angled air drag is going to have a component of air drag acting upward. And the force diagrams really are not going to be significantly different, except for the size of the forces themselves. But when you're talking about the time it takes to reach the ground, we know that acceleration is the net force to mass ratio. And the Solid ball has a larger net force acting on it and proportionally greater mass. In the end, if air drag is negligible, they should both accelerate along the y-axis at a rate of 9.8 meters per second per second. Let's assume down is positive. So perhaps they will accelerate at the same rate. So let's begin, let's actually see this in action. If I hit the, uh, the play button, we'll do this in fast motion. You see if they're fired. That was awfully fast. So let's do it in a more controlled manner. So they get fired simultaneously. And you can see the ball on the left in this example is, is hitting the ground first. Well, not hitting the ground. It's, is is dropping straight down, and it's projected to the right. It's a little different than in the picture I had before. I must have flipped it around. But the important thing is you can see they're falling side by side. In fact. They're going to strike the ground at exactly the same moment. So that is what our force diagram predicted, with gravity being the significant force. Apparently, air drag is somewhat negligible here, that they hit the ground together. So why might that be? So let's look at our force diagrams. 
So the ball that's released, even if it's taking this fancy arc, neglecting air drag, so this won't work for objects like ping pong balls where the, the, the mass is so little, the weight's so little that just a little air drag affects it like a feather. We're, we're assuming objects that are, are solid and, and the effects of air drag are negligible. The only significant force is the gravitational force of the entire Earth on the ball itself. Our x-axis equation, now this, believe it or not, the x-axis equation looks boring. There's zero net force acting on it. So the, the, um, the x-axis equation is basically um, a net force of zero. I don't even have anything to subtract there. But here's the key. We've got a constant velocity model on that x-axis. So whatever velocity it had when it was fired, it's going to maintain that velocity because there's no unbalanced force. At least it's velocity in the x direction. Now in the y direction, its velocity has to change because we've got this negative gravitational force that's applying a net force that, um, that's going to accelerate it. So that's our net force acting on it. So we have an acceleration model on that axis. In fact, the acceleration rate on the y-axis is going to be the ratio of our net force, which is just that negative gravitational force to mass. And since your weight, Fg, is their mass times 9.8, this just comes out to be negative 9.8 meters per second squared for the acceleration in the y. So this would be the same as if you tossed a ball straight up in the air. You couldn't tell the difference on this force diagram. You'd have no net force on the x-axis if you tossed it straight up in the air. And after it left your hand, the, uh, the gravitational force on the y-axis would be the only significant force. So that gives us the following for our diagram here. Our, our horizontal analysis is we have constant velocity in the x direction. Which, in the x direction, we know that because it has zero net force. So projectiles, once they leave their hand, if air drag is, is negligible, there's no unbalanced force to slow down its horizontal motion. The vertical motion is a constant acceleration in the y direction, and because it, that's because it has a constant F net. Gravity is not going to change as it's going up and down. So with a constantly unbalanced force, we're going to get a constant acceleration model. This is the key to this unit, this first discussion. This summarizes everything and, and leads to all our conclusions and all our problem solving for the unit. So let's look at what the combination of a constant velocity model superimposed on a constant acceleration model, what that, what that actually looks like. And um, let's, let's look, if, if you throw a baseball in deep space, it's gonna, its motion map is going to look like this, equal distances and equal time. It's going to take a straight line path. If you drop a baseball in a gravitational field, it's going to speed up a little bit the first second, speed up the same amount, but because it's going faster, it's going to cover more distance, more distance. So that's our constant acceleration model. To superimpose these, though, after one, if this is our time equals zero, to make a two-dimensional motion map, we'll combine the constant velocity model with the constant acceleration model and see what kind of trajectory ensues. Let's see. And then finally, so this would be like, say, one second into the drop, two seconds. As long as the intervals are, are equal in a motion map, it should be an accurate way to show these snapshots are so like a strobe photograph. So four seconds is our final position. But here's the key. Why it, it we have a um, a path that gets traced out that looks like a, um, a downward opening parabola. And that's actually mathematically what exact, exactly what it comes out to be. And we'll see that later in the, um, the next unit. So I'd like to show you another video and see if maybe we can predict this example here. Here we've got a ball that's, that's in this, this cart, and then right about, say, this frame right there, it gets, um, it gets fired upward with this little spring-loaded cup, all right? So the question is, you know, the cart's going to keep sliding. It's on a, a frictionless uh, air track, and it's, so it's kind of hovering on that. And, and so it projects this ball, so the ball's stuck in the cup, and then the ball gets thrown upward. And the question is, where's the ball going to land? This would be similar to being in a bus. 
and tossing a set of keys straight up in the air. Are the keys going to land behind you? Because you're, you're in the bus and you keep moving. Are, the, are, the, um, are they going to land back in your hand? Or is it going to land in front of the moving cart? So I want you to pause it, put some thought into it, and predict exactly where the ball is going to land relative to the moving cup. So pause the video. All right, well, let's see what happens. In the next frame, you'll see that the ball is still above the cup. Next frame, it's still above the cup. Next frame, next frame, next frame. And then it lands right back in the cup again. And the, the cart starts moving on its way. You can see when it moves different speeds in these videos what happens. Here it's going a little faster, it lands in the cup. Here it's going a little faster and lands in the cup. So hopefully when you thought through this, you realize that based on our model, constant horizontal velocity, the ball that was moving along in the cup, there's no unbalanced force to stop its horizontal velocity. So even though it was going up in the air and down in the air, it just kept moving forward at that same velocity. Constant velocity in the x direction. Meanwhile, it was free falling in the y direction. It slowed down on its way up and sped up on its way down. All right, so let's see if we can apply this to a problem. If you drop a bullet from the top of a pretty high building, it may say it takes three seconds for it to hit the ground. So this would be the drop bullet. Another bullet is fired, so that's a, a delta t of three seconds. Another ball is a, a bullet is fired at the same exact instant. So how much time is it going to take this fired bullet to, to drop? Well, this is similar to the fired ball and the drop ball. The fired bullet is going extraordinarily fast, and it's going to hit the ground right there. But the total time of fall, at least according to our demonstration and our free fall prediction, since it's only gravity acting on both of them, is three seconds. Even if it was a you know, we're dropping a bowling ball over here and shooting a bullet, they're still going to hit the ground at approximately the same size, at least if, if, if the effect of air drag is, is negligible enough. And in three seconds of time, you're not going to have enough air drag build up vertically on it that it's, um, it's going to make much of a difference. So we automatically know it's going to take three seconds for the fired ball to hit the ground. Now, that's you know a lot. You've got this complex motion with this parabola opening downward, but we know the time automatically just by solving the vertical free fall problem. Now we'll review the, the free fall solution later. We told you what the time of fall was here, but, but this is a, a key to all our problem solving in the unit. So calculate where the fired bullet lands. Now here we're going to have to assume that the effect of air drag on a bullet is negligible. Now a bullet is pretty aerodynamic, slices through the air, and the air drag will maybe affect its range a little bit. We're going to call this distance the range of the ball. And the symbol we'll use for range in this unit is a delta x. It's the, the displacement in the x direction. In contrast, this distance is going to be a delta y, up and down. But anyways, where, did, where the bullet lands? So our delta x, well, we know that the velocity does not change in the x direction because there's no unbalanced force. Once that bullet is fired, that unbalanced force gets it moving at 3, 500 meters per second and gives it that initial acceleration. But now there's no unbalanced force to slow down that velocity. So in fact, it's going to go, in the first second of time, it's going to go 500 meters in that second. 500 meters the next second. And then as it lands, it's going to go 500 meters that third second. So it's just a constant velocity model on the x-axis. You take a constant velocity in the x times time. So mathematically, it would be 500 meters each and every second, because it's constant. It's not accelerating. We don't have to do any averaging or anything, and it, and it does so in three seconds of elapsed time. Now, our motion map shows to four different positions for the bullet as it's, as it's fired, but there's, there's one, two, three intervals of time between those snapshots. So 500 times three gives me about a 1,500 meter displacement during that that, uh, that time. So that is, in sig fig wise, we'd probably want to round that up if we had to, but, but this just gets, gets across the concept. How far did the bullets fall horizontally? Now this is a question about delta y. And this is, a, we didn't have to do any averaging here because we would have averaged 500, 500, and 500, but vertically it gets to be a little bit, a little bit more to think about there. We've got some things going on in the 
the y-axis, our speed in meters per second, so at time zero, the drop will it is drop from rest. One, two, three, and we know the time, that makes this a little bit easier. So in one second, let's just use, uh, since we have so few fig sig figs, we'll round the acceleration to 10 meters per second per second, so it goes from 10 to 20. By the time that bullet lands, and it was taught, dropped from a pretty high distance, we'll see, it's going to be going three, 30 meters per second. So to find our displacement, we can't just take 30 meters per second times three seconds because it was sped up from zero to 30. So what, what should we use? We know from last trimester that we should use the average velocity. So we're going to average zero and 30 meters per second. And multiply by our timing, which is three seconds of time. So an average of 15 meters per second for the drop, vertical drop. Meanwhile, it's going 50, 500 meters per second on the x-axis, but these, these axes seem to be independent of each other. 15 meters per second times 3 seconds gives us a displacement of 45 meters, which we could maybe round to 50 if we were careful with sig figs. But, but here, the bottom line is, look at, look at this. We've, uh, we've got um, two totally independent solutions. It's simple, constant velocity in the x, in a little bit more complex, changing velocity in the y, but at least it's constantly accelerating. We can make our t-chart and find our average velocity and, and solve our answer. So this asks about the cannon ball versus a bullet. Is that going to make any difference? Well, we know that free fall acceleration is not affected by mass, so it should be about the same. If, if we're making that free fall assumption and that the effect of air drag is minimal, and in a three-second drop, it's not going to pick up enough vertical air drag to really make a difference. The air drag may, on the x-axis, because it's going so fast through the air, may make it get to a slightly less range than, than 1,500, or I don't know how significant it would be. But, um, but, but 1,500 is a good first prediction with assuming free fall. But anyways, vertically, the cannonball and the bullet would drop at the same, with the same timing with, um, with our free fall assumption. So that introduces our unit on two-dimensional motion. We don't have to learn any new models here. Constant velocity in the x direction. That's like a doom buggy. Very simple stuff. And then free fall motion like our picket fence and, and anything dropping in free fall on the y-axis. You combine them together, and that's how we get the parabola. So that's all to start out our next unit. Thank you.